So I'd like to briefly walk you through back to where Nepal was in the 80s and march quickly forward uh, summarizing the evidence that provides the basis for preventing vitamin A deficiency, whether it's through supplementation or diet or in the future perhaps uh, fortification. So we do have questions that we won't answer, at least all of them. Is vitamin A deficiency still a public health problem among children, mothers, and infants uh, based on what kind of data, status, or diet? Where does it occur? Does vitamin A reduce child mortality today uh, in preschoolers, in women, mothers, infants? Are there long-term uh, benefits of early life vitamin A intervention, a cutting edge in science and public health science? Uh, uh, should Nepal maintain, expand, shift, or integrate uh, a better, in a better way, vitamin A capsule distribution? And related to that, is there a dietary safety net that now exists in the country for taking some of those decisions? And that's setting the stage for uh, Dr. Ramesh Adhikari's uh, talk a little bit later. So, functions of vitamin A, it does enable vision at nighttime through the retinoid cycle, the visual cycle in the back of the eye. Uh, if you don't have vitamin A when the sun goes down, uh, you can't see very well. It's very hard adapting to uh, night vision uh, because of the role that vitamin A plays in that process. It also regulates DNA transcription uh, and, and regulates cellular differentiation, and therefore it's required for embryo-fetal development all the epithelial linings in the body to properly function, <clears throat> to replace itself, whether it's the gastrointestinal, respiratory tract, trachea, glandular ducts, uh, genitourinary tract, it's functioning at all those levels. Uh, it's needed for immunity, both uh, multiple aspects of the innate immunity and adaptive immune response. Uh, it's required for forming red blood cells and for bone formation and growth. Um, and we're finding that just the past few months, there was a paper that suggests that the, our gut microbiome responds to different amounts of vitamin A in the gut uh, in terms of maintaining a healthy uh, microbiota community. When vitamin A is adequate, all these things go well, bone growth, reproduction, embryogenesis, night vision, immunity, epithelial lining function, uh, and energy balance that we're learning. It's related to risk of obesity, and that brings up the notion of whether it's playing a role uh, in this, what is called the thin fat Asian phenotype, high percent body fat, normal body weight. When you're deficient, uh, there can be aspects of growth retardation, impaired fertility, teratogenesis, night blindness, and the list goes on. And with the immunity problem uh, uh, being c compromised, we think that's a key basis for why vitamin A deficiency is an important uh, determinant of uh, child mortality. Well, this is a Beto spot. It reflects conjunctival xerosis and keratinization on the conjunctival surface. Uh, what you're seeing there is a patch of cellular debris fed on by uh, various bacilli that uh, can be wiped off of the eye. You can actually wipe that spot away, and what you see is a conjunctival surface that is lackluster. It is not shiny like yours or mine would be when you flash a light on it, reflecting what happens in the epithelial linings of the body as well, because as we know, the eye is not just the windows to the soul. It's the windows to the epithelial linings of the body. If it is bad, if xerophthalmia is in its blinding form, uh, it affects the cornea. And uh, up in the upper left, that is xerosis. Uh, creeping up from the bottom toward the top of the cornea uh, that uh, reflects a keratosis, reflects a, an irregularity, lack of proper metabolism of vitamin A in that tissue, and it can lead to keratomalacia, which is softening of the cornea, which is the blinding condition on the bottom left, that children will develop and go blind from, uh, especially if there's a convergence of uh, poor nutrition, uh, diarrhea, dysentery, a severe uh, infectious illness, uh, and um, in this case, measles. So children who get this condition are very ill. There's been a lot of work in Nepal 
on the, the uh, epidemiology of vitamin A deficiency. Dr. Madan Upadhyay, uh, back in 1980-81, carried out a national xerophthalmia survey in Nepal, finding uh, nearly 2% of children with xerophthalmia. That translated into 75,000 children at the time in the country with uh, xerophthalmia, and about 1,000 with potentially blinding corneal disease. Dr. Subarna Khatri carried out epidemiological studies in the Terai, uh, looking at risk factors for xerophthalmia, inadequate breastfeeding, wasting, stunting, diarrhea, dysentery, all familiar uh, risk factors, previous siblings with xerophthalmia or sibling death, low socioeconomic status, and of course, a poor diet. Uh, studies in the TRI in the, in, in the 90s, uh, you can't probably see that, but their foods are lift, lift, listed down the left side, and those are rank correlations between one sibling's diet and the next. So there is high correlation from one sib to the next in terms of the diet. If the diet is poor for one, it begets a poor diet for the next child, and so forth. So this helps us guide the, the notion that vitamin A deficiency is a chronic uh, nutrition condition that requires long-term solutions. This is a graph from the 70s. Dr. Sinha and Bang in West Bengal carried out a very meticulous study following children uh, for two years, uh, looking at the, the um, uh, seasonality of toe spots and night blindness. And you'll notice that there are peaks at each time of the year. And so the peaks that occur in April, May, uh, form the basis of why vitamin A supplementation today goes on in March and April and uh, in November, December to cut off the peak of xerophthalmia and to try to have the maximal impact when the risk is greatest. Uh, the Ache study in 1982 to 84 first showed that vitamin A supplementation every six months could reduce child mortality. Uh, it had to be answered someplace else and it was answered in Nepal. Nepal has carried out the best trials in the world to answer the question of vitamin A supplementation on mortality. The bottom line is the survival, is the mortality curve of vitamin A supplemented children, and the top curve is that of the controls. This was uh, a 30 percent reduction, and it was followed by another trial in Joomla, in Nepal, with a completely different mortality rate, uh, showing that supplementation could reduce mortality by 29 percent. Uh, in the NIPS-1 study, we further uh, looked at the, the interval to interval. On the left side here, every four months, the children were given vitamin A or placebo. And you can see that uh, when the trial was underway, it was about a 30% reduction. And it was a 30% reduction every four months. It didn't go away. It was a continuous 30% reduction. When we crossed the controls over to get vitamin A, it, the controls went down to where the vitamin A children were. So we continued to dose and follow these children, confirming the impact of vitamin A in reducing child mortality in Nepal. Uh, it's a major finding, a major set of data that has helped guide uh, the, the interpretation and the action of UNICEF and countries around the world to use vitamin A to reduce child mortality. 30% reduction, whether it's Indonesia or Nepal, it seems to be the central uh, estimate figure. When you put the meta-analyses together for the entire uh, South Asian region of the studies, it's about a 34% reduction. The other thing that happens, though, and this is the only data in the world that's come from Nepal, is that children get otitis media when they're preschoolers. Uh, and that is the leading cause of hearing loss from severe infection. When we followed up children in the first trial, 12 years, 16 years later, rather, and did hearing tests, we found out that uh, the children who had had discharge, no ear discharge when they were preschoolers, there was no effect on their hearing loss as young adults as adolescents. If they had discharge, ear discharge, uh, there was a 42% uh, reduction in hearing loss based on audiometry uh, in children who, if they had an ear infection and they got vitamin A, they were less likely to have hearing loss. That is saving the hearing of about 5,000 children every year uh, in Nepal from being impaired later on. And you don't see this being mentioned in the literature because it's only one country but it sure is an important country, and it's here. Uh, vitamin A supplementation 
2001 to 2014, uh, running at 90 to 95 percent. I was bringing this point up because I saw this dramatic reduction in vitamin A supplementation coverage. Uh, and I was thrilled to see Dr. Uh, Lamachani's uh, uh, figure that it's 86 percent in 2016. I don't have 2016 data. So it's gone back up. I was worried, frankly worried, that there was some loss of interest in keeping this program going. Uh, it needs to keep going until the diets are improved in the country. Night blindness occurs in women uh, during pregnancy. Uh, it is a risk factor for many other conditions that women uh, experience during pregnancy. Uh, and it is a flag for women who are, have a problem, who need attention. They need better nutrition. Uh, if you look at mortality of women with night blindness during pregnancy, which is on the left, uh, you find that the mortality rate is high during the maternal period. Uh, the night blindness goes away three to five days after pregnancy, after the fetus and the placenta are discharged. Uh, and some recovery of nutrition occurs. But look at during the late pregnancy period. For the whole first year following uh, uh, childbirth and into the second year, there is an excess risk of mortality of women who had night blindness during pregnancy. And it's due to infectious illnesses that uh, they are more at risk of developing. When we carried out a trial in Nepal to look at vitamin A supplementation or beta carotene supplementation on maternal and infant mortality, we found that there was a dramatic reduction in maternal mortality in Nepal in the 90s if women were given a routine dietary supplement, RDA level of vitamin A or beta carotene on a regular basis before, during, after pregnancy into the next pregnancy. There is also effects on the offspring. This is a diagram showing forced vital capacity of children born to women uh, who were um, given vitamin A, beta carotene, or placebo during pregnancy. And on the far right, you can see the children whose mothers got vitamin A during pregnancy have a higher vital force capacity. Their lungs are larger which is consistent with an animal literature. Then in the placebo and the beta carotene group is in the middle. So one takes animal literature and, and looks to see if you can find evidence in human populations. And when you find it, it brings biological plausibility to not only short-term effects, but long-term effects. I'll go by that slide for uh, the sake of time. But there's also in boosted immune responses even at 10 to 13 years of age in children born to vitamin A adequate mothers. Uh, finally, a, a note about newborn vitamin A supplementation, which has not been carried out in this country, but it has been carried out in several countries in the region. And I bring your attention to Asia, where the relative risk is 0.86. That's a 14% reduction in infant mortality if children get a dose of vitamin A within the first several days after birth. One dose just like for the older children. Uh, that can translate into about 180,000 infant lives that can be saved in South Asia alone every year, with including vitamin A with a safe birthing kit as part of essential uh, neonatal care. The diseases that seem to be affected are those that are related to diarrhea, dysentery, febrile infections that kill young children in the first year of life. So. We have to uh, present uh, and think about uh, an orchestrated plan for continuing to prevent vitamin A deficiency. Uh, it seems that as long as the deficiency exists in the population, we need to continue supplementation. But at the same time, there are new programs on the horizon uh, that we're talking about at this meeting through agriculture, through improving the diet, uh, fortification, Biofortification offers a possibility in the future, uh, and you put all of these together, and it, and it can uh, dramatically have uh, continue to have an effect on on uh, child health in this country. So, recommendations: maintain vitamin A until the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency in children goes down to less than five percent, which we will find out about in the fall. Uh, a dietary safety net is needed that can come from better agricultural practices and the food system improvements, intensify exclusive breastfeeding, we have to assure dietary adequacy, um, and consider newborn vitamin A for reducing infant mortality. Thank you very much. <laughs>